out here. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Everybody lift your hands and thank them. Thank you, Father, for your presence. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your blessing, Lord. Thank you for the rescue, Lord. Thank you. Everybody say, I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim. Because I have been given every weapon of warfare to destroy the enemy. That was a lot to remember. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about the power of abiding. You know we hear a lot about abiding, pressing into the Word of God, pressing into the Kingdom of God. Um, but I think even still a lot of us struggle to abide the way that we're supposed to abide. We struggle to stay filled with the Spirit. Um, there's an area where we get comfortable, we get complacent because what we're fed here is so real. And it is so powerful and it's so phenomenal to us. It seems like it can, I guess, kind of be repetitive because we're spoiled. We've been given a lot. We've been given a ton. And most people out there in the world have no idea what we have in this place. So there's an area where we grow complacent. We get complacent. We start drifting away a little bit. And we think that because we're coming to church Sunday, Tuesday, and Friday that we're okay. And that's a lie. That is a lie. Because we've been given so much, we're responsible to maintain that. And just doing the bare minimum is not enough for people like us. The problem is what we learn here in this place is so powerful and so damaging to the kingdom of Satan. He is on us like crazy. And he is working overtime to destroy us because of what we've learned, because of what we know, because of what God has given us. So to do the bare minimum as soldiers for the Most High King is irresponsible and ridiculous on our part. And that is stomping on the house of the Lord, in my eyes, doing the bare minimum. Because of what we've been given, we're responsible to bring that to people in the world. And if we're just doing the bare minimum, not staying filled, not staying connected, not growing more, battling all the time ourselves, constantly having the warfare for ourselves, we've got nothing to give other people. So this takes a constant maintenance of abiding. Constant abiding, constant abiding, not just Tuesday, not just Sunday, not just Friday, but on your own time. That's where a lot of power comes from. You know, there, anybody can get up at 5.30 in the morning and go to prayer because you're ordered to, but it takes a real soldier and it takes a real warrior and somebody who's really hungry and thirsty after the Lord to get up before you're ordered to go to prayer and pray, to seek the Lord on your own time not just on the times you're ordered to. Amen? Amen? All right. So I've got this here. It says, we can't do the bare minimum and expect to stay free. Doing the bare minimum takes you out of position for fulfilling the perfect will of God. It will cause a slow drift that will eventually lead you back to your old life of bondage. We must live on the offensive against the enemy. What we learn makes us a major threat to the enemy, so we must maintain connection more and more every day. Let's go to John 15. Start with verse 1. Gosh, it's always so hot in here. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> we need like some vents there installed from the air conditioner. John 15. Everybody there? Hallelujah. Everybody read along with me. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. <clears throat> so that's telling you right there it's going to be a hard road. Amen. If you want to bear much fruit for the king, he's going to prune you. He's going to prod you. He's going to sharpen you. So don't complain and grumble when things get tough. Amen. You signed up to be a warrior for the kingdom of God. Amen. So that's what we're called to do, and that's what we need to do. Amen? Amen? 
It says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So we are nothing without him. Absolutely nothing without him. Without his presence, without his power, we are nothing. We are living in survival if we are not abiding in him the way we're supposed to abide in him. You may be going to church on Sunday. You may be going on Tuesday. You may be going on Friday. That doesn't mean you're not living in survival mode. Amen? Amen. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. As the father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. <clears throat> it's powerful. He has called us to be filled with joy. He has called us to be filled with the joy of the Lord and with the perfect love of God so that we can give it to other people. If we are not abiding in him, if we are not seeking him, if we are not staying filled with him, how do we expect to give somebody something that we don't have? You cannot give what you don't have. If you're constantly bound up and you're constantly struggling, you're constantly irritated, you're constantly having a hard time, how are you supposed to minister to people? How are you supposed to be a witness? Pastor says all the time, if you're a Christian and you're miserable, don't tell nobody you're a Christian. Anybody ever find yourself going somewhere and all you want to do is just get in and get out of there? You don't want nobody to say nothing to you. You don't want nobody to talk to you. You hope nobody sees you. You just want to go do your thing and, and go home. That's not what we're called to do. You know, when we're out at Walmart or Publix or something like that, we're supposed to always be on, on alert. You never know who you're supposed to encounter at that Publix. You may be having a one-track mind. You're bound up about something. You're going to Publix. You buy your stuff and you leave. And you may have just missed somebody who needed rescuing. When you are connected with the Holy Spirit the way you're supposed to be, when you're truly abiding in the Word of God, when you're abiding in your relationship with Him, no matter how you feel and no matter what you think, you won't miss stuff like that. Amen. And here's the big deal. We are accountable for those that we miss. Amen. When we get home, there's a record of all this stuff. I don't want to miss people. And I know I've missed them before. And I don't like that. So it is critical. In these times that we're in, the things that are going on in the world, it is crazy out there. And God has put us in this place of truth to learn it and to learn it well so that we can give it out. Amen? So don't take it for granted. Okay, we can all go home now. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 20. So in this, there are many ways that we are called to abide. And I know that one of the most powerful ways that we can give God our constant abiding is worship. Worship, worship, worship. And more worship. Worship is a multidimensional deal. And I love it because the way God functions with worship is he is moving in multiple locations simultaneously. If you can wrap your head around that. God is moving in multi-dimensions in worship. He is in numerous locations simultaneously warfaring, touching lives, and blessing as we worship. So when we're here on a Friday night and we're worshiping, or when we're in our prayer closet and we're worshiping, there are multiple arenas of God reaching his hand out and touching people and rescuing people. And that's what we've got to begin to see. We've got to pay attention to the truth of what the scripture says and the truth of what we're doing, and stop looking at how we feel all the time. Amen? So it says here, what am I doing here? We're going to do uh, 2 Chronicles 21 through 4. 
says, it happened after this that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon and others with them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazan Tamar, which is in Engadi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And this is powerful. What did they do when fear came? They abided in the Lord. They, seek, they were seeking the Lord. They abided in him. The majority of the time, the problem a lot of people have is instead of going to the Lord when fear comes or when attack comes, they go to the phone instead of going to the throne. They start getting caught up in their feelings and what they're going through and how they can fix it. And what God wants us to do is step out of it. Set ourselves before the Lord, get positioned in him, and let him fight the battle. We're going to skip over to um, verse 12. It says, Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah, with their little ones, their wives, and their children, stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Matinah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. Let me ask you something. If you do not set yourself before the Lord when stuff comes, is the battle yours or is it the Lord's? It's yours. When you do not set yourself before the Lord, everything falls on you, which means you're going to lose. Amen? So it is critical, man, that we set ourselves before the Lord when things come. And we constantly hear this, but we constantly don't do it. We constantly run to the phone. We constantly grumble and complain. We constantly go places we shouldn't go. And then we go crazy because we can't understand how we got there. And then you open up a whole nother whirlwind of nonsense for yourself. If we would practice the things that we have been taught and see them through, we could be useful for the kingdom of God. The devil is working overtime to keep us caught up in our little circumstances and keep us blinded to the things that God has for us to do. And we're letting them win. But we've got to get serious about this. We've got to get into abiding more and more. Amen? So it says, Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeru. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Who is what you who is with you? O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed tomorrow. Go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who would sing to the Lord and who, and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly destroy, to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the, the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth, 
No one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. I love that. If we could live in that mindset and position ourselves to seek the Lord in areas of struggle, we could sit on the sidelines and eat popcorn and watch the Lord kick the devil's butt and collect the spoil. And when I say sit on the sidelines, I don't mean do nothing. What I mean is, is you seek the Lord and you press into him, you abide in him, and he does the work for you. He repairs your family for you. He brings the blessing. And when he brings it, he maintains it. Amen? Let's go to 1 Samuel 10. You know, there's something special and there's something powerful about um, seeking the Lord on your own time. You know, in this place, we, we have a lot that we do. You know, we have church three times a week. There's stuff on campus that we do. Um, you're, you get up in the morning and you have to pray and everything. Um, but where you meet him even more and you grow even deeper is in those times when you're not appointed to be in those places to seek him. Amen. When you go in your prayer closet on your own, when you wake up at 4.30 in the morning and seek the Lord instead of 5.30. You know, that was one of the most powerful things for me coming through the program. And early on in the program, I learned that I was tired of my old life. I couldn't do it anymore. When I came to Total Freedom, I was broken. I was, I was through with my old life. I didn't know how to get out of it, but I knew the only way was God. I didn't know how that was going to work, but I knew that I couldn't do it anymore. Amen. And being in this place at first was kind of rough because it is serious business, and it's not, it's not for everybody. But where the power to break free came through was seeking the Lord on my own time, was getting up an hour early before prayer and pressing into him, was not watching movies all the time and getting in my prayer closet, was skipping dinner and going into my room and seeking the Lord and worshiping. <clears throat> and the problem, uh, you know, people have a lot of times here is we're, we're very busy. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff we have to do. There's a lot of stuff that we have to maintain. But I'm going to tell you this. None of that means nothing. You can be as busy as you want to be and make excuses of being busy, but that's all a lie from the enemy. There is always time to seek the Lord. There's always time you have for yourself that you can be seeking the Lord. You can be abiding in him. You can be growing. And if you're truly serious about a new life and you don't want to fall away, I suggest you start looking into that. And I'm not saying that we're not supposed to have fun from time to time and watch a movie or go fishing or something like that. But even when we're doing that, we bring the Lord with us. You know, you're fellowshipping with, with the Lord. <clears throat> if I go fishing or something like that, I'm conversating with the Lord the majority of the time. Come on, Lord, let that fish get on the line. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, I'm praying the Spirit, you know, I'm praying in the Spirit, thinking about meditating on the Word, you know, the Word that is within me, the Word that I have memorized, the, the Scriptures that I have within me. I'm thinking about those things, and we're called to meditate on the Lord all the time doesn't necessarily mean you have a Bible in your hands every minute of the day. But the Word of God is written on the tablet of your heart. So it's with you everywhere you go. So we carry him everywhere we go. We are to abide in him everywhere we go. So examine yourself. Examine yourself and check your fruit. Are you bound up all the time? Are you feeling like you're in survival mode? Do you not want to minister to anybody? Are you having problems all the time? These are fruits of lack of abiding in him. Are you tired all the time? These are fruits of lack of abiding. What we get here in this place is so powerful, it doesn't matter how much you're doing, how many Panera runs you do or bread runs or trailers you fix or anything. The anointing will fill you and empower you to press forward. And tiredness will be overcome. 
So don't let the enemy sell you that lie of, I'm tired. I can't do anymore. I just need to rest. I just need to watch a movie. No, you need to get filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. Where did I say to go? 1 Samuel 10. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Here in this place, we have all been given an anointing. God has pulled us out of a pit of hell and put us in a powerful place like this, and he has placed an anointing on, my, on our lives. We have all been blessed with an anointing from the Lord in this place, and we are all called to share that anointing with the world and to touch people's lives that God has assigned for us to touch. So that's something that we have to cooperate and maintain, and there's no maintaining it without cooperation. Amen? So it says here in verse 1, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, It is not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance. Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? So we have been anointed over an inheritance of the Lord, and we're responsible to cooperate and maintain that. When you have departed from me, Today you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza. <clears throat> and they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. And now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on forward from Tabar. There are three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. After that, you shall come to the hill of God, where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city, that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with stringed instrument and tambourine, a flute and a harp before them. And they will be prophesying. Then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. <clears throat> and let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands for God is with you. So we see that it's our responsibility to maintain that anointing, to worship, to stay filled with him. And as we maintain it, we become a new man. And we are able to fulfill and to complete what God has put before us to complete. Every one of us has a calling on our life. Every one of us has something God's asked us to do. Every one of us has things God's asked us to die to. And it's our responsibility to see those things through and cooperate in seeing them through, denying ourselves, and making sure that we are pleasing to him and doing what he's asked us to do. And I'm just going to tell you, just because you're on fire today doesn't mean you will be tomorrow. Your fire today will not carry you on for the rest of your walk. You will lose your fire. You will lose your anointing if you do not maintain it. And I've seen it happen time and time and time again. People come through this place, they get filled with the Holy Ghost and fire beyond measure. And right now they're out there in the world, using, going to jail, going to prison. Some of them are dead. And some of them are caught up in some crazy doctrines of demons. So let it be known, just because you're on fire today does not mean you will be tomorrow. If you do not cooperate, you do not press in, you do not abide you do not press into the Lord with everything you have and seek him even when you don't feel like it. Seek him when you want to watch a movie. Seek him when you want to go somewhere else. You will fall off. There will be a slow drift. You won't even see it coming most of the time. But if you are truly seeking the Lord and you're checking your fruits, you'll know you're in a drift mode. Let's go to uh, 1 Samuel 16. We must abide, this isn't the scripture, this is something I wrote down, but it says, we must abide in order to keep the anointing God has given us. Satan is constantly trying to prevent us from doing what God has called us to do. Discipline and obedience are key to maintaining a life of abiding in him. Lack of discipline and disobedience will cause you to fall away from abiding, which will nullify your anointing. Disobedience nullifies the anointing. Does everybody understand that? 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 23. <clears throat> so we all know the story of Saul. Saul was anointed king. We just read there that Saul was anointed by Samuel to be king over Israel. Um, and this is confirmation that 
you can't lose your anointing, and you can't be turned over to the enemy. It says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, this didn't just happen overnight. Samuel had a track record of being disobedient and not seeing the Lord's commands through, doing what he wanted to do, doing things according to the way he thought they should be done and not the way the Lord had appointed things to be done, and he paid for it. So it says, But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God has troubled you, is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player of the, on the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you. And you shall be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the, Lord's, the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with, with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by his son David to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And so it was, whenever the Spirit, of God, the Spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. So just because you fall away doesn't mean you can't come back. Amen. There's an area where you recognize your fall away and you repent and you turn and you worship your heart out and get back in touch with the Lord, get back filled with the Holy Spirit, and those spirits got to go. Amen. Let's go to um, Matthew 3. This will talk a little bit about it. We say we're sorry and we repent, but we still do the same thing over and over. <clears throat> and that is why constantly abiding is critical. Abiding is an exchange. So when you abide in the things of the Spirit, you exchange the things of the flesh for the things of the Spirit. So the more you press into the Spirit, the more the Spirit enters you and pushes out the old. Amen. Amen. So there's got to be an exchange. There's got to be a, a transfer and a change in what you're doing. You can't just say, oh, Lord, I repent for what I did. I'm sorry, and then go on your merry way. No, you've got to start pressing in. You have to press in. This is not something that is just like, oh, here you go. You're good now. This is a constant battle, a constant, constant battle. So if you're stuck in a place of thinking, man, I'm not getting anywhere. There's nothing going on in my life. I don't understand this. I'm here at Total Freedom. I'm here at True Ministries. I'm going to church, but nothing's happening for me. What are you doing about it? Where are you at in your walk with the Lord? Where are you at in seeking the Lord? Where are you at in pressing into the Lord? What are you doing on your free time? What are you agreeing with? These are questions we've got to constantly be asking ourselves. When you see struggle, when you see problems, when you see that you're not filled with the Spirit of God, when you see that you're not having things change in your life, you need to look within yourself People constantly want to run to pointing fingers and saying it's this person's fault or my house manager's fault or this guy's fault or my sister's fault and they're doing this and that. They're finger pointers. We need to look within. Look within, see what God's trying to work out of you and get into worship. Get into abiding, get into the word, get into pressing into him. Amen? Amen. It's Matthew 3. And I think we're going to start at verse 1. <clears throat> if you're not exchanging the old for the new, you will constantly have problems. If you are not maintaining and cooperating with the new, you will constantly have problems. You will never complete the perfect will of God for your life and for those that are around you. You will never have full restoration in your life 
It is all put before us. God has given us every tool. He has given us every weapon. He has given us every word. Nobody has an excuse. We've been given everything. Everything we need. The problem is, is a lot of times we're not using the things we've been given. We're not putting them to practice. They're going in one ear and out the other. And this is an area where we've all heard all this stuff. We all know all this stuff. But it's, it's a fruit checking time. It's a fruit checking time for myself. Am I doing the things I'm supposed to be doing? A constant, daily, fruit check. Am I stinky? Or do I smell like strawberries? <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> Matthew 3 says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means to turn away. Everybody understand that? I think that where it gets misinterpreted a lot of times, they just think it's forgiveness and you just keep doing what you're doing. No, it means to turn away. You turn away from what you have been doing and you replace it with fruits of righteousness. It says, for this is he who has spoken or who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out, of, went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brought of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance." And do, do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 1 Samuel 17. No, there's a place where, <clears throat> well, there's always a place where God has us in training. Um, so if we stay in the mindset that everything is training, everything is training for advancement, everything is training for rescuing someone, everything is training for blessings to pour in, for your life to be restored, for your children and family to come back into your life, for things that you've lost, that the enemy has stolen from your past to be restored, if we get in that mindset, <clears throat> we'll think a whole lot harder about seeing things through. Amen. A lot of times we get into the, the training and we want to run because it's hot and it hurts. But when you stick it out, God works on you and he, he sees things through with you and blessings pour into your life beyond measure. Your family is restored. Your finances are restored. Your vehicles are restored. Your houses are restored. Your lives are restored. Don't run from the training. <clears throat> I love the story of David because he is someone that started off so small in the kingdom. He was a tender of sheep for his father. He was the youngest, so he was the nobody in his family. <laughs> a lot of times we look at position as being who we are, and that's a lie from the pit. I don't know about you, but when I came to Total Freedom, I was in a lowly position. I didn't have a penny to my name. I actually had acquired more debt than I could ever imagine through courts and lawyers and all kinds of other stuff. So I was in a very lowly position, and that's okay. God uses your brokenness, and he uses you in that area to train you up. 
Amen. And that's where David started, was a, a tender of sheep. But he saw things through with that, and God blessed him with more and more and more. <clears throat> so let's read here. What do I have here? 1732. This is, I mean, I love it. It is so powerful. So here he is. He's been sent down to the battle from his dad, tending sheep to go to the battle to bring food for his brothers. And it says, Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, hey, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, as he's a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that he built faith like that from lack of abiding? Do you think that that kind of faith came from not abiding? What do you think David was doing in those fields, tending sheep? Man, he was pressing in, man. He was pressing in. What do you think he did when he got off work from tending sheep? He was pressing in. He was happy to be training, to be learning, to be growing and the love of his life, Jesus. He did not sit on YouTube all day. He didn't watch movies all day. He didn't go have fun all day. He was abiding. He was pressing in. He was being trained up. It says, so Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. <clears throat> David fastened his sword to his armor, and he tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, I am a dog that you come to me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defiled, or whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give you the carcass of the camp, or give your carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. <clears throat> so we know that David assembled his stones, he took out his sling, and he struck Goliath right in the middle of his forehead. You know, I, I truly believe that when he was in those, those fields that God had him in training, you know. Has anybody ever tried to use a sling, those old school slings before? Is it, I mean, I don't know if you ever have or not, but I, I can pretty much guarantee you they're pretty hard to use, and especially to be accurate enough to hit somebody in the forehead. So what I see in this and what I've learned from this is that in the places that we're at, we're being trained up. And you have an opportunity to either grow in what God is asking you to do, or miss it. If David had gotten to that place without being in that field, searching the Lord, abiding in the Lord, giving God glory, and practicing with that sling, how much, how much do you think he practiced with that sling? A lot. Amen. He wasn't sitting over there grumbling and complaining about the position. He's like, man, I'm watching these stinking sheep, man. I'm the lowest one on the totem pole of my family, man. This is terrible. I can't deal with all this stuff. No, he was practicing. He was practicing. He was hungry for the Lord. He was hungry to do what God had him to do. He was hungry for his God. 
And that's what we're called to be. We're called to be hungry for him, hungry for more, abiding in the training, being equipped and ready to face the giant that God has for us to defeat. And if you're not in the fire practicing, if you're not in there seeking, if you're not in there learning and growing and gaining strength from the Lord, you're not going to make it. Can you imagine if he'd have been put before that giant and he pulls out his sling and he's rusty, hasn't been practicing nothing, and he slings that rock at him and it hits him in the elbow? He'd be dead. So we have got to stay positioned. We've got to stay disciplined and obedient to what God has put before us, no matter how hard it is, no matter what you're going through, no matter what it looks like on the outside, no matter what it looks like in the, norm, in the natural realm. We have got to stay focused on the spirit. Things can look pretty bad in the natural realm. You know, I've been away from my kids for over four years. Nothing within me wants to be restored with them. There's, there's nothing I want more. But I don't want it until it's God's time. And he has not made an opportunity for that to happen. There's things that are still being worked out in me and my children. There's things that are being worked out in. But one thing I know is the word of the Lord never returns void. So what he's promised you, he's going to see it through. And it's up to our cooperation and our, our sacrifice and our surrender that is going to get us to those places of the things that he's promised. If we do not cooperate and we don't see things through with obedience and we don't learn what he has for us to learn and learn it well without grumbling and complaining, without kicking and fighting and throwing a fit, we'll never receive what he's got for us. And I don't want to fail him. And that should be a desire within everybody to be pleasing to him, to be pleasing to him and to not let him down. So don't look at your circumstances of being a problem. Look at them as a challenge that God is strengthening you in so that you can help somebody else make it through. Amen? See things through in your training. Don't give up. Don't let it beat you up. Don't let it beat you down. And don't let the devil beat you down when you make mistakes. Get up and keep fighting. See it all the way through and learn it and learn it well. And don't focus on what you have and what you don't have. Because you may have nothing now, but you stay in position and you do what God's asked you to do and you see it all the way through, he will bless your socks off. I've had so much restoration in my life, it blows my mind the things God has done in my life and restored in my life. It blows my mind. I would have never thought that it could ever happen. But he has brought it. And he will do it for every one of you. Let's go to Matthew 6. There it is. I'm sorry. It's Matthew 6, Matthew 7, 24. I apologize. Yeah. Everybody good? It says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. That's a key part there. Cooperation. Does them. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like an idiot who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Let them build the house. Surrender it all to them. Give it all up. Step aside. Seek him, and let him establish you. So you know what? Let's go to 2 Kings 6. Everybody there? Amen. Amen. So it says, Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such place. 
And the man of God, which is Elisha, sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. So pretty much what's going on here is the king of Syria is plotting against Israel. Elisha, the prophet of the Lord, who was constantly abiding, constantly seeking the Lord, constantly looking to the Lord, God used him to expose the enemy so that they wouldn't fall into a trap. Do you think that God will expose your enemies if you are not abiding? No, he will not. You will fall into a trap every single time. It is critical that we abide so that we do not fall into the traps of the enemy. When you abide, he will expose your enemies. It says, Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None of my lord, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I, might, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounded, surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? This dude was panicking. I mean, he was panicking big time. They were surrounded by all kinds of military and everything. So Elisha answered him and said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with him. Does that sound like somebody who's abiding? And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. <clears throat> you know, when you're in a constant abiding, when you're constantly seeking the Lord, when you're constantly knowing the Lord, no matter if you're alone, you know that there are countless, countless angels and there are countless amounts of military that are with you at all times. God is always on our side. He is always fighting for us. He's always got us surrounded by angels. He is always going before us as a consuming fire. But if you're not abiding, you don't know that. You don't live in that. And we have to live in a place of knowing that wherever we go, we're surrounded by armies of angels. And we are called to see that way. And we are called to use those angels to bring destruction on the enemy and to warfare for the lost. I don't think his servant was abiding as much as, as he was. <laughs> you know, like Elisha was, there was no fear there. No fear whatsoever. And that is, there's some fruits of, of abiding. There's one thing, three things you can count on that will always happen when you are abiding. There's no fear. God always makes a way of escape. And he will always expose your enemies. Go to Ephesians 6.10. The <clears throat> pastor was talking about a couple weeks ago about um, this being a time where the body of Christ is on the offensive and no longer on the defense. It's a time and season where we're taking it more to the enemy and taking it more to darkness than they're taking it to us. And when I hear stuff like that, and when we hear stuff like that, it should cause us all to see ourselves, to search ourselves through and see if we're taking stuff like that serious and to not take stuff like that lightly when you hear it because that means we are supposed to be seeking more. We are supposed to be bringing destruction on the kingdom of Satan more. We are called to warfare and to kick the devil's butt for the lost out there. And so when I hear pastors say things like, this is a time and season for us to be more on the offensive and not the defensive, I see that as a time to wake up and to get real and to get serious about the Lord more and more. 
and to press into him more and to die to my flesh more and to seek him more. And those things that I want to do need to start being put to the side to do the things of the kingdom. The times out there right now are crazy. I mean, it's always been crazy out there, but it's, it's, it's crazy, man. It is crazy. Witchcraft is heavier than ever. <clears throat> and, and, you know, the, here's, the, here's the thing, too, is people who practice witchcraft and Santeria and practices of the occult, man, they abide. They abide in what they believe in. They press into it day and night. They stay up late. They wake up early. They hate us with everything they have within them, and they will press into it. Don't you think that we need to be doing the same thing? If they're coming on us that strong, we have got to be coming towards the kingdom of Satan that strong. They don't let their flesh get in the way. They don't care if it's midnight. They don't care if it's 3 o'clock in the morning. They don't care if it's 6 in the morning. They're trying to speak death on us. They are trying to consume this world with evil. And right now, the most amazing thing that has ever happened, we've got a president in office who is coming against all this stuff, who is exposing all this stuff. And we are called in this time to back that up and to press in and expose it as well, to speak the truth, decree the truth, to warfare, and to press into the spirit more and maintain that connection to the spirit so that we do our part that God has called us to do. And without abiding in him more in this time, you're going to be constantly fighting off spirits and demons that are trying to antagonize you and bring you in the flesh all the time. Ephesians 6.10. And then one more scripture. <clears throat> so we've got to be armored up. And we've got to be prayed up. And we've got to live in the spirit. It says, finally, my brother, and be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. I want to I go back to that real quick. How do you expect to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might if you're not abiding? Amen. Amen. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand... Stand therefore, having girded up your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with a preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints." And we're going to close at Revelation 4. <clears throat> Praying always in the Spirit. There's a place where we have got to constantly maintain the fear of the Lord. That has got to be a constant. You know, in Proverbs it says the fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you're not maintaining the fear of the Lord, you're not walking in wisdom and you're not walking in what you're supposed to be doing. So we have got to maintain the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> and I love this scripture here because it is a, it is a powerful look at the throne room of God. And there is a, a reverence to me with this scripture of who I'm serving, the power of who I'm serving, the might of who I'm serving. And that's something that we have got to start taking serious and make it something that we're constantly looking at. We serve a powerful and mighty God. We are constantly putting limitations on him through our doubt, through our unbelief, and through our lack of pressing into him. So there's got to be a place where we come into maintaining the fear of the Lord. Amen? So it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. 
And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardius, stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. <clears throat> and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word today, Lord. We are honored and blessed that we have been called into this house of truth. We apply the blood of Jesus to this sea, Lord, and I ask that you would cause each one of us to search ourselves through to do a constant fruit check, a constant examination of self. Are we pressing into you the way we're supposed to? Are we digging deep so that you can abide into us and so that we can be positioned to do what you've called us to do? <laughs> we thank you, Father. We thank you for the rescue. We thank you for your love. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name.